Mr. Thomas. Colonel yes, Thomas. we are. <laughs> we really are. Yes, I really thank you um, for this opportunity to just sit down with you and just learn more about your life and who you are. You're just a prominent figure, not only in my life, but those who you, you truly impart and mentorship, everything. So Colonel Thomas, please tell us more about who you are and a little bit about your life journey. Well, of course, I'm a colonel retired now, but if you backtrack to the first beginnings, I grew up in a place called Birmingham, Alabama, which uh, at that time was the most segregated uh, southern town in, uh, in the south. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, most of my learning initially came from people who taught me, like uh, my principal and my mother, uh, because they actually taught Black history. And I was really aware at an early age that I was being told that we did not have any history. And therefore, my mom made it emphatically a task to teach me all that she could. And from that, she read a lot, which uh, when you really think about it at the time, she had only a third grade education. Mm -hmm. But her mind was pivoted toward making sure I understood I had a legacy. And we had a cousin who lived in Tuskegee, and we used to go out to the air base. As a kid, you know, you just like the planes, et cetera. And that was fantastic. However, my uncle explained to me who the Tuskegee Airmen were. And I just liked it because they were some of the sharpest dresser and great speakers I had ever heard at that, you know, at a young age. And uh, for me, it was a period of growing out, trying to figure out what I knew about life, would have to deal with in life, and certainly find out any heroes or sheroes that look like me. Uh, the only one my mother really indoctrinated me to was the Tuskegee Airmen and, of course, the Buffalo Soldiers. And you know how, as a young kid, you just kind of think, okay, they're saying all this stuff, boring. <laughs> but then as I grew older, I realized the, uh, what she had left me. And all of us look for when the parents are gone. What legacy did they leave for us? Mm -hmm. And that will always be uh, remembered as my mom and uh, my uh, principal at a, a black school who was emphatically set on helping me learn. Well, how that translated is I grew up and began to see parts of the, um, of the uh, symbolic and material thing happening in Birmingham where everything was segregated. And, and just an example, you couldn't drink any water from a fountain that was just water, but they had it white only. Or you couldn't, as a female, go downtown Birmingham and buy a dress. And if it didn't fit, return it. If you didn't, if you got it, you just stuck with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the disrespect that they had for your mom and dad, calling them by first name when sometimes they were 15 to 16 years old. And basically, just the basic human rights. What were they? How could we make a change? Mm -hmm. And then as a teenager, I began to attend some of the meetings at the 16th Street Baptist Church where the four little girls were killed and got to know uh, many people there that I didn't even know would be heroes or sheroes at that particular time. Just had no idea. It's kind of, if you, you've been there where you grew up, you saw a lot of people, but you know, they were just people. Yeah. And not realizing the effect they would have on you. And uh, I went to the meetings, were told that this is what we're going to do to change Birmingham. And for me, you know, it was people thought, well, I always ask you, was it scary? No, it wasn't. When you have nothing, you have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. You only can go forward and realize what had happened to your parents, your grandparents, all those items that, and, 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 and within you, you incorporate all those people that uh, lived before you. So for me, it was going to the 16th Street Baptist Church, learning how to protest, et cetera, and, and going to jail. And mm -hmm. Birmingham at that time of year is probably one of the hottest places. I think I always told my mom it was hotter than hell. It had to be, because, yeah. you know, and when they threw the hoses on her, they thought they was hurting us. Literally, they were cooling us down because of the heat. Yeah. But the bottom line was we demonstrated and our idea was to fill up the jail. So basically they couldn't 
they couldn't do anything because they weren't used to handling that many people. So if 2,000 went in, 2,000 came out, two more thousand went back in, and we kept doing that. The significance of that I'm saying, saying this is that it set the pace for my tour in Vietnam and becoming a soldier. Because I don't think there was anything harsher than being in Birmingham and dealing with these uh, segregationists. Uh, I don't, I've never faced anything harder than that, including Vietnam. So it was a stepping stone for me. And I always say, you have a task and a purpose. In that task and purpose, you have to figure out how to fulfill that purpose. And for me, it was simply doing this and feeling great about it. And most kids at that age feel good about it. We got a chance to get out as activity and yeah. the whole works, you know. Was it dangerous? Absolutely. Uh, did you think of dying? Yeah, it's in, always in the back of your mind. He's never a child. But it never came to f- fruition until they killed the four girls in the 16th Street Baptist Church. Then we realized how much danger we really were in. And that just uh, intensified us and, and made sure that we went out and did the demonstrations in that commemoration, which also then led us to Selma, Alabama. And so the respective part of that is that everything has a connection point. And as I always talk about that tree, you know, in the branches, yeah, you can have that one uh, tree there, but it has many branches. Where it leads you to is that it either bears good fruit or it bears bad fruit. Yeah. Both blacks and, and Birmingham, it bore great fruit because out of that came some of the greatest leaders uh, I've ever seen and had never really even heard of. Uh, we had a pastor there named Reverend Shirley Worth. And remember two things were happening. TV had just, well, you won't remember, you too young. <laughs> but in, in that era, the TV had just come out in 1955. Mm-hmm. And the world thought that it was movies, you know, they didn't realize what was going on in Birmingham till they actually saw the violence. Mm-hmm. And that spread it nationwide and, and you know, countrywide. So that helped us in the program itself. After that, I had already gotten uh, two years of college uh, in, at, at Miles College and went off to war. And when I came back, I got, of course, the other part of the college uh, uh, curriculum finished and graduated. And with that, it even heightened the intensity to prove that many, many Blacks had done great things. And uh, one of the things I had was uh, logistical concern with this professor who basically stated that, uh, and I will just tell you straight up, he simply said, niggas have never done nothing in this country. And then we had one of the most vicious arguments, almost got me kicked out of the University of Alabama, which I was attending then. But I brought it before uh, the president. He reviewed it. And what it was, the professor gave me F turned into A plus. And also the debate was, I had found all these uh, circumstances of Blacks who had created great things and done great, uh, uh, had great uh, leverage in how they were completed. And was able also to go down in Tuskegee with my uncle and talk with some of the people aboard there. And it presented a great opportunity. And of course, things took off from that. I went from there to Viet- from college back to Vietnam. And then it started a military career. Um, and from that, I was able to generate a lot of friendships, a lot of people who uh, were not from the South, who who looked like me, but I never uh, dealt with those issues. And it became then a thing of discussion, conversation, and making sure, you know, that we leave that legacy for our young folks. Um, The ironic thing is growing up being segregated can lead you to be frustrated because you don't see anyone who looks like you accomplishing things, especially in the area I was in. Basically the place where I was born was a dump. That's what it was. That's what they dumped all they dumped. Uh, Dirt and all trash. And they would come in and smooth it over and whatever, but we could not get fair housing because the Fair Housing Act had come out uh, from uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but it wasn't for Black folks. You couldn't really bank anything because you didn't have anything to bank. Mm -hmm. But what we did learn out of that struggle between Black and white who were poor is how to support each other, which is a divide right now. 
But we learned that if someone was sick in the white community that we knew, like my mom worked for, my job was to make sure she got soup and all the nutrition she could. If my mom was sick, she came over and brought uh, stuff to eat for us. So that was an underlying, uh, I guess, uh, story behind se even segregation and learning how to get past the barriers and limits that were, were set for you. Um, the, once I had left Birmingham, we went to Selma, mm -hmm. it really began to set some fear factors in place that people were dying and they were being killed by the Klan and other people. And uh, I think then the fear factor came in, but what it did for me, it learned, it, it lent to me the whole idea that once you can overcome a fear, you can live. And that's what happened in Vietnam. The survival skills really set in. And I guess I was a good student because they said there's a tripwire there. You don't touch that tripwire. Yeah. I didn't touch the tripwire until I got help. So a lot of the things you learn, I learned from the civil rights movement carried mm -hmm. over into the military, which became 39 years for me. Um, yeah, in retrospect, would I do it again? Absolutely. Would I hope that people who uh, are mm -hmm. coming up, I would hope that they will remember this and, and read. I mean, I read at least five books a week and I read them because I like hearing about other people's lives and stories. Also, I like to see the struggles they went through. And the bottom line is, you know, we have accessibility to those things mm -hmm. that when I grew up, we didn't have. We had a bookmobile. It came twice a month and you can only check out so many books. But I, I was an advocate reader and my mom was very good in making sure I did that. Yeah. And so you begin to learn and you hear about different parts of the world. You say, well, I want to see that. Well, what option did you ha we have then? Well, the military was one. And it was the reason why, I, I, and I just share this with you. I went into the military is that after they arrested me, uh, the policeman told me basically that we're going to kill you. And my mom was terrified. So he said, you either got a choice. You can, you know, you can leave or you can die. And I simply went, well, I'm dead. I can't help anybody. So I decided that I would join the military and, and thinking, oh, okay, if I join the Air Force, they're not fighting in Vietnam. And guess what? Join the Air Force, off to Vietnam I went. So you can't always depend on what people tell you. But that's the, the effect from civil rights to uh, the military. And of course, you know about Selma. Uh, Selma was one and please tell us more about your experience in Selma. Selma was where I was helping a priest at the time I was going to the Catholic church. I used to drive for a priest because he uh, had bad eyesight. And we would go down to Selma mm -hmm. and deliver groceries. And it's kind of amazing that certain parts of uh, Selma were black. The whole county itself is 73% black, but they, didn't have a lot of food. We would take food there. And in the process, I ran into some of these sisters who ran one of the convicts. And they just basically told me, said, you know, there's a march going to happen. You might want to, you've been in the one in Birmingham, you might want to go over to Selma, not realizing that this would be <laughs> uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge or that I would be beaten and thrown into jail. So I went and I had told the priest, I said, I'll be back in a couple of hours. That's how you know, work. Well, a week later, I'm still in jail, and he's still down in cell, but neither one of us could get back. Eventually, they got me out, which was good, mm -hmm. but it was one of the scariest places because the Edmund Pettus Bridge is right across the Alabama River, and people used to tell me when you're young, you know, if you fell into a river, you could swim out, whatever. Well, if you fall in the Alabama River, you don't get out because the bottom is totally mud, so you are stuck there. Mm -hmm. And that was more uh, terrifying than anything. The idea of being thrown in the Alabama River, not being able to get out of it. But we didn't realize across the bridge were all these troopers with batons and mm -hmm. horses and everything. And as we were marching, you know, they said, no, you need to turn back. And John Lewis and Hosea Williams, uh, who were leading the group, said, we're not turning back. And so they charged us with the horses. We were knocked down and, and beaten with steel batons that kind of thing, you know, and uh, 
you had to figure out how to coordinate people that had been hurt to the hospital because there was still a small black hospital, but a larger white one, and they wouldn't let you into the white one. So if you got X amount of people that are hurt, you got to figure out who's hurt the worst and to get them to the hospital. So the experience was one that we realized that would change the uh, nation. And in that, you know, we, we set to a march again. The good thing, as I always said, you have a task and a purpose. Mm -hmm. The judge who gave us the order didn't like George Wallace. They went to school together and he mm -hmm. despised the guy. So when George Wallace said, you know, segregation now, segregation, you're not gonna march. You know, the judge came around and said, march, I'll approve it. And we did. And so it highly, highly ticked off George Wallace because, uh, you know, as most governors, and they think they are all of this, the truth was, God uh, has a task and purpose for us all. And when he intervenes, it works. You know, that's not to say it's not going to be a hardship. It's not going to be tough, but it intervenes. That whole idea is once we set that course, we were able to bring in many folks from the North, a white preacher, Reverend Reed was killed. He was run over by one of those... Um, things that paved the street. And they knew they killed him, you know. And Paolo Luso, who came uh, from Detroit and was shot by the Klan and killed. And Jimmy Lee Evans and, and a ton of other people who in, and actually, your father was in the military. So a good example of that is a legacy that's carried over. There were four people from the military who were killed, who had nothing to do with the civil rights movement, were just trying to get back to the base. And one was a shot point blank in the head by a policeman because he didn't know what was going on. And I always tell my wife that, you know, this thing now with black males getting killed, it's all about the trophies, you know. You don't have the, the lion is not endangered anymore. Mm -hmm. It's black males that's endangered. That's the trophy. And uh, if you really look through history, you'll see that manifesting itself all the way through history. Um, and Selma was a dear teacher that how precious life really is and what you do during that length of time from the time you're born, mm -hmm. that dash in the middle and that end date. And that dash for me always symbolized the life that you lead, what you do with it to make it good or better for people who come after you. Um, and so that was the manifestation of Selma. We marched, we got the Civil Rights Act pack, uh, passed and it's still valid today. That's why they're trying to, uh, you know, destroy the whole voting process because it is valid and it did work. But, uh, you know, many people were in the marches and some of them, you know, that are still alive, I still have a friendship with because, not because we are, you know, the friend like next door, your girlfriend or boyfriend, nothing like that. It was like, we did this together. The mission was completed. Mm -hmm. And in completing that, it made us stronger as individuals. And in being strong as individuals, we now can get some of the good jobs. We now can get uh, some of the things that we never could think or even afford to get because we didn't have the money, you know. Mm -hmm. um, back then, you know, $13, $14 a month was a lot of money. Well, the average income was about seven seven dollars a month. Mm -hmm. and I know for you that seems like it's small. You probably spend <laughs> that on, 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 on <laughs> yeah. Well, for us that was great, you know, because I do remember those times as a kid where the only thing I got for Christmas was an apple. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the way it was. Um, and you know, I, there was there was a type of resentment from me because during Christmas. My mom had to work for this white lady, you know, and, and then she would bring all the leftovers home, which uh, to date bugs me about leftovers, you know. And so there are a lot of things come out of you find out about yourself, first of all, then you find out about, mm -hmm. you know, community. And I always talk about community because it is what Dr. King said, the beloved community, no matter where you go, you know, you can come to Minnesota, you're in a community, you go back to South Carolina, you're still in the community. It's what you do in that community and how you help others that makes a difference. For me, it was growing up understanding, and I had a lot of mentors, you know, and I think we're missing that today. I had a ton of it. I had some of the deacons of the church who own my case every day. 
and you don't know anything about this, but you know, you did something wrong, you got your behind whooped the church, you got it on the way and you got it when you got home. Mm -hmm. But it was accountability. And it gave me a type of discipline that probably saved my life many times over in Vietnam, you know, listening to what was said. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know, ask the question. And in asking the question, they always provided me with an answer. So those are the lessons learned out of both Birmingham and Selma. Incidentally, the four little girls that were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church, one of my mentors was the dad of uh, Denise McNair. He was a professional photographer in Birmingham. And so that's how I learned photography. And he taught me the essential because he's the only blind place for uh, blacks that go for photography at all, you know, in Birmingham was a large population, but Chris knew everybody. He said, yeah, I'll teach you if you want to learn. And from that, you know, I got to be into another field that I really knew I could love and I really could deal with it still today. I take a lot of photographs and I see if I can improve on them, make them better. And I kind of wonder at that because I said, you know, God made a beautiful world. We as humans sometimes ruin the thought of it being a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, I said, you know, when I look at my pictures, I see good, good stuff. But when I look at the world and see what he created, I see magnificent stuff. Mm -hmm. And I always want it to be that good. And so I think you have to have that kind of tenacity. You want to be that good at whatever you do. Yeah, I agree. And you um, spoke about mentorship. So what... Um explain the importance of having that mentorship well the importance of that is that it gives you basically mentorship to me is guidelines mm -hmm. guidelines of how to get where you want to go and also in how quick you want to get there uh mentorship means i got to take the time to let you know much like we're doing now telling you my story so if you don't remember anything except he was in the civil rights movement or he was in uh you know vietnam you still learn something. You came out of there learning something. And we need mentors who are willing to sit down and have patience with children, adults, whatever, and tell them, this is how we did things. Now, let's talk about that. How does that work for you? Maybe it doesn't work for you. Okay, let's look and see what kind of plan works for you. And if we can do that and you can stay on course, then the things are achievable. But I always say, you know, you set your bar high. And if you fall, you're still on good ground, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you want to change, you can change. But be also uh, in a situation where you can switch from one job to another because you not only have the credentials, but also because you have the experience. Mm -hmm. That cuts down on, you know, uh, them discriminating against you because after a while they realize you're a very talented person. And you live in a world now where talent is, uh, has a price tag to it. It really does. Um, I admire you and some of the others who model, uh, you know, um, because we need to get that image out there. Uh, too often we've seen only one image and we think that's the only image out there. And we need to overcome that and realize that beauty is beauty, okay? And with that, you need to understand what it looks like. Uh, I don't see the world out there with just one color. You know, I see the greens, the reds, or everything. And it has a function and it makes it beautiful. And, and we have beautiful women. We need to showcase that. We need to endeavor to tell them, so look, I know it's, I know it's hard out there. Here's what I'll do. I'll help you do this, this, and this. But the rest of it, you got to carry on yourself because I can't determine how you want your life to be. I can only help share to get you there and make sure that you are functional enough to then invest in either the education, the whatever it is, to go the, the last uh, stage of, the, of, your, of your life, you know, or where you want to go, where you want to be. I always ask that to kids, where do you want to be in 40 years? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What does that mean? I mean, if you don't know, how can I help you? How will I ever know where you will be? But my thought is this, if I can help you, or I'm, I can tell you, so well, you know, you need to check with so-and-so. I'll call them, make that phone call for you. And we used to do that, even when we had the old rotary phones. You don't know nothing about that either, but it's okay. The old rotary phone, where you had to dial it, and it's a three, the way you come, somebody on the other line. So would you please get off the line? They said, nope, I had it first. 
that kind of thing. But eventually getting through and telling people, uh, I have this person that beautiful soul who wants to learn how to do this. Can you help them? And if you can help them, I would certainly appreciate it. And people that's been through what we've been through are certainly willing to do that. But sometimes people are either don't want to ask or they feel, well, I can do this on myself. You can only do so much on yourself. Uh, God made us that way to depend on each other. That's what the blessed community or a beloved community is about, is going wherever you go, you can help somebody to raise them up. You know, if I'm only going to be there to put you down, you don't need me. You absolutely don't need me. You need somebody that's going to help you get up and try to get higher than they did, or at least get where they want to go and be happy with that. Too many people are already unhappy with their job. And it's kind of funny. I laugh and tell my wife, the people who aren't happy about being at jobs that didn't like where they were at. Now they have no jobs and we know where they're at. <laughs> so you have to you have to have a tenacity to uh, bridge that gap. And mentorship, that's all it is, is bridging that gap for you, sharing and learning from you what you want to do. How can I help you? Uh, how can I make things better for you? I don't know what you go through, um, you know, I, but it has to be a cross-reference to male to female, female to male, anyone that can help get you where you need to go. Talk to them, you know, find out what is needed. Uh, there's a great community out there. Sometime uh, I found here by just walking and I can't do very much because of the surgery, but walking, people will stop and ask me uh, about Vietnam. They'll stop and ask me, how do I get my benefits? And within the community I am, at least 20 people have gotten that benefits who had given up on them because the problem was going the wrong way about it, okay? The, the direction is what men mentorship is also about. Helping me get in the direction or a feel for where I want to go in that direction that would benefit me and make me a source of power. The problem we have is there's always power and privilege, but it's not within our race because we have not done the right things mm -hmm. or we haven't led our young to understand that if you gain power, if you gain privilege, you can open up doors for other people. And in doing that, you not only make your life better, and I think God blesses you for that when you do that, because we're put here to help each other. Uh, then at least I gave you the chance, not only as we used to say, to put your foot in the door, but to open that door wide and wherever you go through that door leads to a better prosperity for both you and your family, you know, and, uh, I'm very proud of both you and your sisters uh, and what you're doing because you have a, a plan and most of us go through life with no plan. And the sad thing is I see it all the time. Well, what's your plan? Well, I did this and it didn't work. Okay, what's your backup plan? Um, I don't know. And, you know, I always say, you know, if you have a plan and I did that when I taught at Diomi is when in, if you have a plan, you got to have a backup plan and you got to another, have another plan behind that one because life is not certain. You know, the moment you might get in a job, what if the corporation shuts down? What are you going to do? You know, and most of us live on a, on a day to day basis or even a monthly basis. And we can do better than that. You know, we got to learn how to teach young folks to invest. We got to learn to teach them how. Mm -hmm. Well, as they say, if you got the pie, you got to know what the pudding is that goes in the pie where to go to get it and how to get it. And, and there's a strategy to that and uh, how to keep you from being shut out. So that's what mentorship to me is. And it also tells me that I've done some of the things right with young folks because they do still ask. And, and, and that's when you know it's been mm -hmm. creative and, and successful when they still come back and say, okay, you know, you told me this work. I've had people approach me at bowling analysts who simply said, you know, you don't remember me. And, you know, there's always a fear I've done something to offend somebody. And uh, yeah. me and my wife are standing in the bowl and then this guy comes over to us and said, oh, sweet Jesus, this guy could probably crush me with one arm. And he said, you remember me? And I said, yeah, I remember you. What did I do to you? And he basically said, no, I want to introduce you to my family. Mm -hmm. And you straightened me out. And I've got this family, a great job. And I want to say thank you. I mean, that's, that's worth a million bucks there. So those are the type of things that, you know, mentorship can lead to.
Yeah. And next question is the last question. Um, if viewers want to connect with you, ask questions, um, what's a good contact? Well, you have that, Nathan Thomas Holt, dfl.r.com. And I'm always, hey, I'm retired. I'm on Nate Thomas time. So if you call me, I'll call you back. Yeah. But I, uh, I just want to emphasize that we need each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the young need the old and the old need the young. And we need to remember how we got where we, mm -hmm. we are going. You know, uh, whether that's through that one person saying one day, do you remember, and I don't know if you do, you was pretty small, when your sister spoke at Deomi? Yes. It was a proud moment because not only did, were your parents happy, it made us happy because what you guys didn't know is what we went through to get you in there. And we said, we will make sure this happened. And we did. And, but there's no sense in worrying about how we got you there. The problem, the, there was no problem because we did get you there. And who knows, you know, who would have thought she would be where she is today or where you are, you are today. I mean, and we're very proud of that. So a lot of that is in an indirect way of mentoring, but giving uh, your sister the opportunity just to talk about Dr. King. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were impressed, you know, the soldiers left there saying, wow, outstanding. And so that's what happened. You know, you're not going to get it necessarily in money, but you get it here. And once you get it there, you can broadcast to the world. Hey, I had somebody to help me. And guess what? It worked. I agree. Thank you so much. I know we're short on time, but any mm -hmm. last words or advice you will share? Yeah, um, I do emphasize a lot, do a lot of reading. I mean, there we have a ton of people. I just finished reading Stacey Adams uh, mm. uh, from the outside, uh, John Lewis across that bridge. And, you know, uh, Let's come to your uh, library and borrow your books. <laughs> oh, yeah. A actually, you can because you know what? I donated to a library up in uh, Thomasville, Georgia, uh, Jack Hadley's Black History Museum. And I, once we read them, I have so many, we just donate them. But yeah, you're always welcome to have us send them to you. Um, it's time consuming, yes, but it's brilliant because you learn how people, you think your, your case is the worst one of all, and then you read about them and realize, wow, I'm impressed with that. But anyway, I just want people to grow. I want you to grow. I want your sister to keep growing. Uh, all of you growing. Uh, you'll be leading this nation. It would be lovely to know that when this, this old carcass here is gone, there are some young people that are willing to take up that flag. And we had a thing in the military, we said, if I fall, who will pick up the flag? That's the same thing I say to you and the younger generation. Uh, who will pick up that flag? Okay.